as I have been preparing this series and uh, doing this research, it's really uh, in my head, um, even though I'm in my office, I, there's this feeling that I get. And so I really have to share this with you. And it, and it's some, it goes like, go like this. <laughs> yeah? I had, to, I had to get special permission from my five-year-old to bring this. Um, before I left, he said, Dad, make sure you come right back home with that. <laughs> um, but we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about uh, archaeology. And, uh, and, and for me, my fascination with archaeology began, I think, with the place that most people began. That was in Indiana Jones, right? And, and I, you know, in my head, I, I really would, it, 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 it makes me excited to think that maybe there's some place where I, I might have to actually swap out a, a bag of sand for some idol, you know, and then, and then run for my life. Um, but that's really not what archaeology is about. And so, uh, just to start out, we're going to give ourselves a little bit of an education on archaeology. Uh, Archaeology 101, a very basic understanding of, of how they do things, um, so that uh, so that when we're talking, we kind of are all on the same page. Uh, so it starts with, and, and I'm going to just do a disclaimer, I am not an archaeologist. Um, however, uh, I've consulted a couple of archaeologists in doing research and, and got our sources um, from them. And, uh, and, and I'm hoping, actually, at the very last week, we're going to Skype with an archaeologist because we're going to be talking about his dig. And I, I, think, I think we're going to be able to work that out um, and, uh, and, and have that live for us uh, here. Uh, he, he, does, he looks like Indian and Jones, but with red hair. Um, and not at all like Harrison Ford. So that's unfortunate. But uh, anyway, so here's how this goes. But all, all of this is about archaeology in Israel. And so um, all of my study and, and research has been in that area. So these kind of things might not be exactly how it's done everywhere. But in Israel, when they're looking for a site, when they're looking for a, 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 a place where they're going to excavate, generally they're looking for something called a tell, T-E-L. And a tell is a, it's, it's a big mound of earth. And uh, that actually is the tell we're going to be talking about uh, next week. That's uh, Jericho. And so, um, so what, you know, they, they kind of look around and they say, but this is right in the region where we expect this site to be. And they start looking around for big piles of dirt that don't make sense, right? Because the, the reason that they end up as big piles of dirt is because, you know, when the first people settle an area, uh, and they, they make their houses and huts, and then uh, the, the stronger tribe comes along, and they, they have a battle, and they, they knock down all of their huts, and they build their own huts kind of on top of that, right? And then they, they progress on, and they, they become a city, and they've got walls, and their city, of course, is it the strongest uh, city around? And, and so a, a neighboring city comes and attacks them. And they, they knock everything down and they build back up. And so what happened over time is there's, there's kind of layers. I think of it growing up, uh, growing up in Panama City and now uh, living in Mobile. It, it's kind of like uh, the hurricanes, right? On the, uh, on the beach, on the barrier islands, you know, I've got a lot of friends who lived on the beach. And, and, and what would happen sometimes is the, you know, the, the hurricane would come through. And if it was just the right one or you know, just the right place, and their house would be gone, right? It would just be all kind of collapsed down, and debris would be everywhere. And, uh, and, and, if, and sometimes it would even be the case that if the storm surge was just right, that it was even already covered back over with sand, right? And, and, uh, and so you could actually, actually just put new posts down. Right for your nice house this time that's going to be more sturdy and, and build on top of it, right? And you can imagine what happens is, is, is as that happens, if that happens over and over again, then you end up having like layers and layers, like a multi-layer cake of debris and of kind of civilization. Those are actually called strata or strata. And so this is, uh, I, I think you can see it there. So you see there's a couple of different types. So of, of blocks, right? You've got this one here, and then you've got this one here, and you can't see, but right in here, you can see that there's nothing, that there's nothing in the original image. And, and so what happens is there's layers and layers of all of this debris. And you can, um, 
And so obviously the, the most recent layer, the, the one on the top is the most recent. And so as you kind of go deeper and deeper, you go further back in time. And so, and then at some point, you, as you're digging, you get to a point where there's nothing. It's just dirt. And you can kind of mark that as the beginning of the, of the occupation of that site. But the real important question that you've got to ask uh, that I, I'm sure is already on your mind is, how do they know when each one of those things happened? Now, it, when I had this question, my answer to myself was, um, was radiocarbon dating. I'm not really sure exactly what that means, but I've heard it in the History Channel specials, right? And so I know that they can take that and they, you know, there's, a, there's carbon compounds that, that decay over time and they can look and say, okay, look, this is uh, a certain amount of old, right? The problem is that uh, dating, those kind of dating systems, the, the kind of chemical-based dating systems are expensive and they take a long time to do, right? You can't just... Uh, you know, have uh, you know, a computer in some sort of bo magic box that you put the stuff in and it spits out a date. It's kind of a big deal. And so, there's other ways that they can end up dating these. If, you know, another great way is if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're digging through and you're in a layer and you find some coins with a date on them, obviously, uh, you find a bunch of coins like that because they're, if we're in this kind of time frame. But really, the way that they date almost all of these really old sites in the Near East is uh, something called pottery or ceramic typography, pottery. So pottery is commonplace in the world of the Old Testament, the world of Jesus. Pottery is what you got everything in, what you held everything in. There were jars and containers for all types of different things. And, and so what that meant is it was everywhere and um, and, and, and then, so when the things were destroyed, you find hundreds and thousands of broken pieces of pottery in all of these layers. And so what they've done is, is they've been able to match up the layers, uh, or the, the pottery, to other dating, either the, the kind of uh, scientific chemical dating or, you know, the, the um, uh, coins or that kind of thing. And... Um, it turns out that pottery, pottery went in and out of style rather quickly uh, in this area of the world. I think of it kind of like cell phones, right? You know, if, if in the future they're digging in our fictitious layers upon layers of hurricane destruction on Dolphin Island, right? And, and they're digging down and they, they, find, uh, they find, you know, my, my iPhone 5 in one of the layers, they can, they can look and say, okay, the iPhone 5 was really popular around 2012, 2013. They dig a little deeper, and, and then they find a, an original iPhone, right? And they say, oh, this must be from the from mid-2000, 2004. And they, they might dig down a little deeper and find one of those nice old Nokia flip phones from the late 90s. And they, if they dig deep enough, they could even find a, a phone in the back, right? Um, and, and you can, it's the same thing, it's cell phones all the way along, but you could, you could really date our culture very well by cell phone discovery in layers. And so it's the same thing with pottery. Uh, the pottery has very distinct features, how it was made, the materials it was made out of, and then the shapes, the colors, the style of the pottery. And so um, people who, uh, who God bless them, I cannot imagine what, how, like, how tedious it is. They'll, they'll take that, right? That would be like one box from like a four by four foot square from one layer. You take that, and they will draw each piece in a very specific technical way. And then they match their drawing to this list of things, this list of already kind of correlated dates for that style of pottery. And so they can look, they can take one of those pieces of pottery and, uh, and look at it and, and draw it and then come over here and say, oh, well, that's uh, 550 B.C. And so that's, that's a whole lot of what archaeology is. A whole lot of it is digging through layers and layers of history. 
and, uh, and finding, locating the dates of those by examining the pottery. Now that's not the really exciting, dramatic part of archaeology. But it turns out that's actually, as with most things, the every the day to day of archaeology turns out to not be Indiana Jones. It turns out to be little brushes and uh, and lots of broken pieces of pottery. Uh, we're not going to talk a whole lot more about broken pieces of pottery if that's okay with you, right? <laughs> we're going to try to focus on the unusual things. And today we're we're going to begin with Noah's Ark. So in G Noah's Ark, the story of Noah's Ark is in Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, we, we find that, uh, that it, it, the ark comes to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Uh, the mountains of Ararat. Whoa, let's do one of those. There we go. Mountains of Ararat. And in the mountains of Ararat, um, we know where those are. They are in current day, in current day Turkey. And, uh, and Armenia. So it's, it's a really large swath of mountain ranges. So all of a, all of a sudden, just kind of at the beginning, it's, gonna, it's clear that it's not going to be easy to find this boat that was, you know, six, seven, eight thousand years ago um, floating around and comes to rest on one of these mountains. Not just because it's wood on a mountain, but also the mountains, a lot of them, are now covered in snow. And so, not only are you going to be trying to find something that's been there for a long time, it's probably covered up, but you're, you're in places where it could be covered up with snow yesterday, right? And, and so, this is a, a very, very difficult location to find something. Um, now, that does not stop people from trying, of course, right? Uh, one of the most well-known uh, persons who claimed to have found Noah's Ark, uh, he went on an expedition in uh, 2006. It was a former SWAT team member named uh, Bob Cornu. Now, if, you're, if you think I may have misspoke, I, I didn't. I did not say uh, an archaeologist or a geologist or a historian or any sort of professionally trained person in ancient Near Eastern history or archaeology. Okay? It's a SWAT guy. I got a former SWAT team member. So, uh, but it was, a, it was an exhibition with him and a whole lot of cameras from the Discovery Channel. All right? and, and, I, and I understand, because when you have two proposals sitting on your desk as a television executive, one starring a former SWAT team member, other uh, archaeologist and his brushes, right? <laughs> We're going with SWAT team every time, right? Because this is not interesting to watch, right? But the guy hanging out of a helicopter pointing with his massive muscle on the that's it. That, that's good TV, right? So uh, this guy, Bob uh, Cornu, he, uh, he, he sets out and, and, you know, you've got the helicopter flying and it's, it's really good television, okay? And they're looking all over for this boat that um, was so many thousand years ago, and eventually they think they find it. And, uh, and so they, they look down and they see um, rocks that appear to be in the shape of a boat. Right? And so you think of maybe like the wood petrifying train rock over that amount of time, and, and, and that's it. So th they go down, and, uh, and he says, I'm just going to quote him, uh, we had thin slices of the rock made. And when they examine them, it says, we can see wooden cell structures in the rock. And that is a picture of one of the slices right there. Uh, that's what they found. And, you know, I'm not a geologist. I, I don't know anything. And I look at that, and he says it's cell structures. It's no art, <laughs> right? And so, uh, of course, they go live on all of this stuff. And, uh, you know, the Discovery Channel makes a lot of money in advertisements, and he does a lot of interviews with anybody who will take him. And, uh, but, archaeology is a field full of people who are incredibly smart, full of people who are incredibly skeptical. And, uh, and so when somebody claims to have found Noah's Ark, there was a, an outcry from the archaeological community saying, 
give us some of your slices and let us look at them, right? And so, to his credit, he did. He handed them over to a guy named Kevin Pickering. Kevin Pickering is a geologist with uh, the University College London who specializes in sedimentary rocks. So he is the guy that you definitely want at your dinner party, right? <laughs> I, I can't tell you the, the number of fascinating conversations about sedimentary rocks that I've had in my lifetime. Uh, but this guy is the guy, you may not want him at this dinner party, but he's definitely the guy that you want analyzing the slices because this is exactly the kind of rocks we're looking at. And so uh, he analyzes the rocks and he says, why don't you just quote him because I'm not, I'm not a geologist. He says, the photos appear to show iron-stained sedimentary rocks, probably thin beds of silicified sandstones and shales, which were most likely laid down in a marine environment long ago. Translation, not the ark. Alright? He says that what we see there is not wood and cell structures, it's stains from iron that is in the ark. I mean in the in the rock. So unfortunately, uh, you know our SWAT team guy uh, made some good television but didn't find Noah's Ark. There's another guy um, who felt like he might have located the place and wanted to go dig around and Turkey wouldn't let him in. And so instead of digging, he got satellite photographs. And, um, and he got NASA satellite photographs of the region and he published uh, a, a work that, was, that identified you know, this, this little you know, piece of the image and said, hey, that's Noah's Ark, right? But uh, it turns out also not Noah's Ark. Uh, you, you, can know, you can find out a lot of information from sat satellite photos, but uh, it's not really great archaeological practices. Now, conclusion of Noah's Ark, archaeologically speaking, is we don't know where it is. We just don't know. We don't know, and the other problem with Noah's Ark is that um, scholars that are really experts in um, the literature from this region, from this time frame. They point to the fact that Noah, it may be, the, the story in the Bible may be more like a parable, less like a history. So when Jesus tells parables in the New Testament, the sower and the seed, Abraham and Lazarus, and all those kind of deals, uh, you, you're reading the stories, but you're not assuming that, that they have uh, they're a history. They're, they're detailing every little thing just right. His parables are really focusing on, on telling you some specific truth. And, and, and it turns out that there's a couple of stories from that region that predate Noah that are very, very similar. One is almost identical. Um, that, that tells a, a very similar story with a, with a totally different outcome and with a God who is very mad in the story. Um, now, Noah... So what that means is that it is possible, I don't know, I don't know if I would say probable, it's possible that the Noah's Ark story is, is more like a parable than like a, a science book or a history book in our schools, right? It's possible. And so what that means is a lot of archaeologists, legit archaeologists, don't want to spend life and money looking for uh, this. Not only is it going to be hard to find, but it, it's, uh, it, it's possible that it's not there to find. And so, uh, when we talk about Noah's Ark, um, we say, we don't know where it is, and, you know, probably, probably we, we won't ever know where it is. We probably won't ever know where it is, because the people are, who would be the ones really qualified to do it are not going to do it because of that, that kind of theory of it possibly not even being, uh, being history and being a parable. But, the Ark of the Covenant is a different story, right? The Ark of the Covenant, there is nobody who will deny the fact that this thing was around and it was actually made and lots of people saw it, touched it, well, not, not many people touched it, and, and the ones who did, didn't live much longer. Um, but, so, so lots of people saw it, it was a real, actual thing. But the problem with the Ark of the Covenant, the really mysterious thing, it's from the Bible, so... Uh, in, uh, in the year 597, um, the Babylonians conquer Israel. They 
take them off into captivity and they ransack the temple and take everything out of it. Right? And then, later, they actually get to go back, they rebuild the temple, but when they rebuild the temple, the ark isn't there. The ark is gone. So the time of Jesus, the temple in the time of Jesus, in the Holy of Holies, there was no ark. There was no ark of the covenant. Instead, there was a, there was a rock there called the Shediastum. And the Shediastum, uh, it's still in, in the, the Dome of the Rock, right? The, the, the Muslim temple. It's got, you, you could go look at, if you're a Muslim, you could go and look at that rock. Uh, but the Shediastum is, is said to be the stone, um, it's, it's said to be the place where God reached down and, uh, and picked up dust and, and breathed into it and made man. It's said to be the place, the same place where um, Abraham came to sacrifice Isaac. And, uh, and, and all of that, it's a really powerful location, and that stone is a, is a big part of it. So that's what was in the temple. The question is, where did it go? Now, if, if you just read the Bible, you assume that when they took all the stuff out of the temple, they just didn't get that back. Right? Now, if you look at Babylonian history, and you look at the, the records that they kept, they, you can see where they brought all this stuff. And Solomon's temple was a marvel in the world. It was incredibly beautiful, and everybody knew about it. And so, when they took all that stuff, it was a big deal. And they, they kind of paraded it through, and they, they made a list of everything, of all of these amazing, priceless, holy things that they took. And, and got to have in, in Babylon. And so you've got the lampstand, you've got tables, you've got all kinds of temple pieces. But you don't have the Ark of the Covenant. It's not in that list. And you'd think that if you were going to brag about all of the stuff you got, the golden box with the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, and manna. That's the physical presence of God on earth. That if you touch it, you die. Like, that's going to be the thing you brag about, right? It's going to be the, the centerpiece of the parade in the town, right? And so it, it seems very clear that it was not in the temple at that point. So, what happened to it? Right? Did it, was it destroyed? Was it captured? Was it hidden? So there's several different theories about the Ark of the Covenant. And in, in, in the first one, it's probably the least likely. It's another um, guy who's a, an amateur archaeologist. His name was uh, Ron Wyatt. Now, um, he is, he, he kind of came onto the scene and, uh, and made some claims of a lot of things that he had discovered and saw. And it turns out a lot of those things aren't, aren't, um, aren't accurate representations of reality, right? You might call that lies. So some people call that that. Um, but he said that he was uh, digging around. He was underneath. He found some, um, some caves underneath the, the Golgotha, right? The place where Jesus was crucified. And when he was under there, he found the Ark of the Covenant. And he noticed that, that, that when Jesus was crucified, that blood, the blood of Jesus, had actually run down through cracks in the rocks and had dripped on the Ark of the Covenant in the, two, in the, in the caverns below. Now, I really wish that was the one that's the most reliable because... I'm going to tell you, I can preach like 10 sermons on that, right? That is really cool and uh, really symbolic. But there's just no proof, and he can't find it again, right? So that's probably not the one beneath Golgotha. Uh, the second place, and this is really interesting to me, is that it's under the Temple Mount. Now, under the Temple, it's got catacombs, right? It's kind of like... Uh, under uh, St. Peter's in Rome, right? There, there's, there's all kinds of tunnels and catacombs. And so, uh, in 1982, the Israel Antiquities Authority, the, the Jewish Archaeology Association, uh, began to, 
tunnel under the Temple Mount. Now, now the Temple Mount itself is controlled by the, by the Muslims. But they kind of went to a part, an area that they owned, and they figured, okay, they own the top. But underneath, I mean, that's, that's a wrap, right? Because we can start a tunnel here and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. And then, and then we're in the catacombs underneath the temple. So they did that, and they, they dug, and then they, they got to this beautiful gate. They opened the gate, and there was this chamber inside, and there were all kinds of artifacts from the temple. All kinds of things that were used in temple worship. And so, they, uh, they began to take this out, but it, it caused a huge stir, because you, know, you find that stuff. You, that's not things that you can keep secret very easily, right? So as soon as they, they started pulling this stuff out, uh, the, the, the Muslims uh, were very upset. And very upset that they had tunneled under their mountain, right? They had, they had kind of violated their property rights. And, uh, and they threatened to go in themselves and clear out everything. And so instead of doing that, the, uh, the is Israel authorities, uh, they plugged their tunnel. They plugged it up. They filled it with concrete, okay, so nobody could get in. And, uh, and, and they, they, they sealed it up. But before they did, a couple of rabbis said that they saw the Ark of the Covenant under the Temple Mount. Not all of the people who went in there, not all the people involved in the dig, but a couple of rabbis said that they saw it under there. So, it could be beneath the temple. <coughs> There's another place in, uh, in the Maccabees, which is in the, in the Apocrypha, it's, a, it's an apocryphal book. I mean, just, it's in the Catholic Bible, not in the Protestant Bible. There's this passage in, in Maccabees chapter 2. It says... Uh, the prophet Jeremiah, being warned by God that <coughs> Babylon was going to you know, come, uh, commanded that the tabernacle and the ark should accompany him till he came to the mountain where Moses went up and saw the inheritance of God. That's not legal. And when Jeremiah came, he found a hollow cave and he carried in the tabernacle and ark and the altar of incense and then stopped up the door. And so that's the, it's a, in Maccabees it says that he went and hid it, and then after that it says that when they uh, went back to mark where it was, the people that he sent to mark it couldn't find it. And, uh, and, and for them it says, well, when God wants the ark to be found, it'll be found. So maybe it's in this mountain, Mount Nebo, we it, it, but it's another fool's errand to try to find something like that. A cave that was sealed up thousands of years ago. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult to find. But, um, there's a, another place. It, it's that it was that before Babylon ransacked the temple, it made its way to Ethiopia. Now, I, I find this story really fascinating, really interesting. I don't, I don't know why it's, it, I don't know why that, um, that people say this is the most plausible. As a matter of fact, National Geographic says that this is the most plausible, plausible theory for the location of the ark. So, I'm not National Geographic, so we're just going to go with that. This is the most plausible theory. So here's the story. Uh, before, uh, obviously, before Babylon came and, and, and did all of what they horribly did. Um, it made its way to Ethiopia by, uh, by way of the Queen of Sheba. So the Queen of Sheba goes to visit Solomon. That's in the Bible. And, and in the, the stories in Ethiopia, she went to visit Solomon. Uh, let's see, it's got a great term for this. She went to visit, visit Solomon to receive from his wisdom, if you know what I mean. And so she went there she received from his wisdom, and on her way back, she found out that she was pregnant. She got all kinds of different wisdom from Solomon. Uh, he was a very wise man. Uh, so Solomon, uh, she, she found out that she was pregnant with Solomon's baby on her way home. And, uh, and she named that child Menelik. So Menelik, when he gets a little bit older, he goes to visit his dad. And he's a prince. 
So, he doesn't travel by himself. He has an entourage. You know, you're probably talking 20, 30, maybe even 50 people traveling with him mentally to go visit his dad, Solomon. And he hangs out with Solomon for a while, and then he comes back home. And when he gets back home, he finds out some of the people in his party had stolen the Ark. They had stolen the Ark of the Covenant from the temple. And because of that, or because of the fact that nobody died, Mentally felt that the ark, it was the will of God that the ark had been stolen and made its way there. Because all the stories that everybody else knows about the ark, you, you try to do something that, it, that God has only done with the ark, you know, it's just like lightning bolt to the head, right? And you're, you're, you're gone. So he said, well, if nobody died, then maybe God wants it here. Um, which is very convenient as far as, you know, if you're thinking of it from a... a, a a faith perspective of God uh, allowing that to happen so that it's not stolen by Babylon. Um, and, and so what happens, the rest of the story, we, we, I won't go into all the detail, but it, it moves to a couple of different places for different reasons. And, and it ends up at a church, uh, the Church of St. Mary of Zion in Axum, Ethiopia. That's a picture of that church. So the ark is said to, to be in that church. So why haven't we seen all the pictures? Well, it's because that church is built solely for the ark. And there is one priest, uh, he's a monk, who is called the keeper of the ark. And for his whole life, what he does is maintains the ark. He cares for it, he cares for the ground and everything. It's like, that's his job. He is the only person that is allowed to see it. And then when he dies, another person will be appointed. And this has happened for hundreds and hundreds, you know, supposedly thousands of years, that, that this has been going on. And so uh, National Geographic sent a reporter to do all their, their, their stuff on it. And, and when they, their reporter actually went to, this is an Orthodox church, okay? It's an Orthodox church. So he, he went to basically the Pope of the Orthodox Church, right? The, the guy who, who really should know these kind of things. Like, what's... You know, if the Ark was in a Methodist church, you know, you would expect at least one of the bishops to know which church it's in, right? So, he goes to the Pope of the, the Orthodox Church, and he says, okay, so this, you know, they say they've got the Ark of the Covenant. Is it the Ark of the Covenant? And the Pope of the Orthodox Church says, yes, it is the Ark of the Covenant. So the follow-up question is, obviously, what does it look like? And his response is, well, I, I am not allowed to look at it. The only person that's allowed is the keeper of the ark. Not even the head honcho of the whole thing is allowed in. And so, National Geographic says, Axum, this little building with peeling paint on the roof, is the most plausible location for the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know about you, but that kind of gets me excited, right? The idea that it could be there. Now, I mean, I'm not, I'm not. Um, but the reality is, well, there might not be it. He's, that, that guy, he might really believe it's the ark, but, you know, if, if you let a couple of scientists in with their, uh, their whatever the tools are that they use to, to get the, the radiocarbon dating, you know, it might not turn out to be it. So, why would we even talk about that? Right? If we don't know, why, why do we spend this kind of time? And see, there's this, this, this weird thing that we do. And we do this a lot. And, you know, each night we're going to end uh, really talking about faith. Some of these are going to be directly related to the Bible. And some of these are just going to help us understand ourselves. And this is one of those that helps us understand ourselves. See, what happens is there's, there, are, um, there are times where we can, we can really want to find an answer. Really, really want to find an answer. And so um, we do whatever it takes to get the answer that we want. And there are times that we really want to find a certain answer, and we get to the, you know, we get to this moment where the answer that's coming back is not the one that we want. 
there's a, there's a book in the Bible um, uh, called the Book of Job. And Job is, is, is a great, it's just really interesting. He has one of these moments where, um, where things aren't matching up. So his whole world is, falls apart. He loses all of, all of his, his, his cattle, all of his livestock, so he can't make any money. He loses all of his ch children, and he gets really sick. Now, the way they understood the thing is if you are a good person, good things happen. If you're a bad person, bad things happen. End of story. If you're a good person that does something bad, a little bad happens. But if you're good in, a, uh, in general, you're going to have all good happen to you on the whole. Now, the one thing that we know, that we can be confident of about, uh, about uh, Job is that he was a good person. He was an incredibly good person. He was very, very righteous. And so, he has this re very difficult place that he exists in. Everything in my life is falling apart. All these horrible things are happening to me. And I'm a good person. And then he has this belief in God, this faith that says, if I'm a good person, good things happen. Those two things do not match. And he has this, this really hard time. And his friends, his friends come to him, and, and this is good. His friends come to him, and they all share the same belief. Good guy, good stuff happens. And they say... Look, Joe, um, we've got to make this work, right? You obviously aren't good. Because if you were good, we know good things happen. So you aren't good. And I don't know what happened, but I'm really sorry for you. Uh, you're not a good guy. And Joe says, no, I'm a really good guy. I don't do anything wrong. And then another person's like, really? I mean, when nobody's like, right? You've got to do something wrong because we all know. If you do good, if you're a good guy, this stuff doesn't happen to you. And so, in, in the story, you have the friends that take these two things and kind of make them fit, right? They say, Job, you're a bad guy. They make all kinds of concessions to make it fit with this belief. But Job doesn't do that. What Job does is he has these two beliefs that disagree. He this is true, and this is true. And they seem to contradict each other. And what he does is he holds on to both of them and doesn't make them fit. He lives with this ambiguity. He lives with this tension in his world. And, and he says, God, this does not make sense. I am trying really hard to make sense of this, but it doesn't. You're going to have to explain this to me. And then God is not saying it. And God doesn't an answer. And so he asks his friends again. And his friends do the whole same thing. And but over and over, he holds on to these two. He says, this is true, this is true, and I'm waiting for the solution. Now, there's a, another passage in the Bible. I, there are, one of our pastors here, Jeff Spiller, and I started a, a Bible study in the RSA Towers on Wednesday at, at, at noon. Uh, it's like a lunch Bible study for anybody who works downtown. And, uh, and this, this last week was our, our first week. And, um, and we talked about this story, this story right here of Mary and Martha. Um, and, and, and Mary and Martha, it's really an interesting story. It's, it's really brief. Yeah, so he goes there, and, and Mary, or, I'm sorry, Martha, is, uh, is preparing food. She's getting ready for dinner. And, and Mary is sitting at, at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and told him, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And he says no. And in this story, the story you've got Martha is telling Jesus what he needs to do. And what he needs to say. Mary is listening. And, and that telling and listening is, is what's happening in Job, right? That the friends are telling him what is happening. Telling him exactly what's wrong. And telling God how that Job is not righteous. Job 
is listening. And as difficult as it is, there are times when our faith and our understanding of God doesn't match our world. Right? I, I can't tell you the number of people that, that have, have come to me and said, you know, I, I really struggle with uh, you know, evolution and, and, and the Bible. I really struggle with um, you know, the, the, an all good and all loving God and the fact that like horrible things happen in the world. Like, I really struggle with those things. And I believe that these two things are true, but they don't match up. And so you've got an option. Either you dig up some rocks and call it wood, right? And you lie to yourself and you compromise your understanding of the world. Or you do like Job and you hold on to both of them until, until you can find a solution that, that matches reality. And so instead of, of telling them what has to happen, you listen. So that's really what we're going to try to do over the next several weeks. Next week we're looking at Jericho, and it's going to be really interesting. It's one of the most, um, one of the most uh, studied archaeological sites in the region. Um, but, what, but our goal is going to be to listen <coughs> and not to tell. Right? Our goal is going to be to, to take what has been discovered and listen to it and see what it tells us about our faith that we didn't know, what it tells us about Christianity that we didn't know, and then maybe I think that, that as we go step by step through this, we're going to get a better understanding of God and how he works in the world if we start, like Job, like Mary, listening. Let's pray. God, we confess that there have been moments where we have been an amateur archaeologist on a helicopter wedging things into the way that we see the world. We have ignored, you know, we have ignored things that disagree with each other. We have, we have not been like Job and, and waited and listened. We have not been like Mary sitting at your feet listening to you and listening to our friends and family and God, we, we confess that we've done that, and we, and we ask. We ask that as we, we go through this series, and, and, and over this upcoming week, would you help us to listen? Would you help us to listen to you, to listen to the word, to listen to the people who love us and who are trying to help us grow closer to you? Would you help us to listen to you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, we'll be back here next week. And if you know somebody who might be interested, we've got some flyers on that table. Please take a couple, uh, stick them on a bulletin board at work or however you can, you can help spread the word. And we'll see you back, back, week, ne back here next week. Uh, did the walls of Jericho really come tumbling down? <laughs>